Okay. Hello and welcome back to the ROI podcast, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And today we're back for round three with uh, Uncle Mara, my good friend, the Bowtie Mara. Agenda for today, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking specifically and almost exclusively about the great nation of Argentina. We're going to talk about the current political situation the future and investment implications of that. We're going to talk about the upcoming elections in November, monetary and fiscal policy. We're going to uh, finish with a brief update on the economy, including real estate, crypto, la bolsa, and basic geo arbitrage, uh, updating on our previous conversation, and much, much more. There is so much happening. Stay tuned. Uh, the great man on the ground in Buenos Aires, Mara, is going to tell us what's happening. First, disclaimer, nothing that uh, we say here is to be considered financial advice. It's just two guys with their opinion uh, commenta commentating on uh, some of the most bizarre uh, happenings that I've ever witnessed. And so that is the agenda. Stick around. We're going to hopefully provide some entertainment and informative commentary. Uh, shout out to the sponsors. Uh, if you like the shirt that I'm wearing, a lovely bamboo Kojo Fit. Uh, you can get 10% off your order. Link in the description with the code Benjamin10. And today's podcast is sponsored by the Options Mavericks, Substack community that I author, uh, where I show you how I run essentially a one-man insurance company trading options. The publication... Uh, uh, is read in 34 countries and performance last week uh, had you copied the trades that I share with you you would have made 2525 US dollars from a margin requirement of only 52475 performance year to date uh, is a monthly average of 7.35% we're on track to do 88% returns annually Obviously, past performance is no guaranteed of the future. If you wish to start your seven-day free trial to simply learn more about what I am doing, the link will also be in the description. Now, Mara, uh, it is my pleasure to have you back uh, on the channel. Uh, there's, an, there's an awful lot happening. We're going to dive straight into it. And I think the best introduction would be based around a certain coffee cup that you have, which on one side has a, a, a boy saying, I'm bored in Spanish. And then on the other side, it has the Argentine flag and uh, the caption says, you were bored. So let's, <laughs> talk, let's talk about yeah, that's, that. That, that. That is basically uh, what happens uh, every single week or every single day or hour. Uh, it, at least in the last uh, 48 hours, it's been every single you know minute almost. It's, it's really been uh, one of the most you know, crazy uh, crashes that we are witnessing at this time uh, ever since I've lived here. And, you know, I've been through a couple of defaults and a lot of inflation, uh, devaluations, et cetera. But this one is really one for the for the history books, I think. And it's, it's, you know, it's a really, really big Molotov cocktail that combines uh, a couple of uh, pre-existing uh, crises uh, into one or, you know, ones that Argentina already went through um so yeah it's it's i really have a hard time figuring out how they will get out of this hole uh yeah and that's what we're going to talk that's what we're going to talk yeah. about today i think we really need there's so much happening we really need to to break it down uh argentines yeah. uh, have just become accustomed to this as a way of life uh as a result of their history and so at the moment they're they're kind of nonchalant about it you and i spoke about um uh, offline before about it just seems like another week in Argentina because there's always <laughs> yes. there's always something <laughs> happening. And it's true that saying that there are weeks where decades happen and decades mm -hmm. where weeks happen. But I, you've been talking about this well for well over a year, looking out at the fiscal cliff that the, com yeah. uh, the country was facing. And I, I want you to talk about why this time really could be much worse than what people are, are sleepwalking through given the fact you have the potential for the worst of 1989 and the mm -hmm. worst of 2001 where we saw hyperinflation and then essentially a, a devaluation of the currency mm -hmm. as best you can yeah. run us run us through the last 48 hours uh, of madness um so yeah it's it's been a while i think it's been about two months or maybe three that the uh, central bank 
has basically been been dipping uh, well below uh, their reserves in terms of liquid reserves. So, uh, you know, what they're trading uh, with every day, because this is also something that most people won't understand if they haven't lived here for a while. But uh, what Argentina is basically always doing, uh, the central bank, is uh, trying to maintain a uh, uh, currency rate that does not exist, the official currency. Now, for this, they are selling uh, dollars all the time into the market. So every single day they sell 200, 300 uh, million dollars to try to, uh, you know, uh, meet the demand of, of people that want to buy dollars and that way sort of uh, trying to stabilize as much as they can uh, the currency market, which is absolutely forbidden by the IMF, but they keep doing it anyway. And the IMF doesn't really care, uh, or so it seems, or just let them do whatever. Uh, so with that, the reserves, they go down and down and down. Uh, now, normally, in a normal year, you would have a lot of additional uh, USD inflow just because of, uh, you know, crops and, you know, Argentina produces uh, quite a bit of agricultural goods, uh, which is one of the main sources of income for the government and the federal coffers, just because there's so much taxation going on there with withholding taxes, et cetera, on exports. That, that usually fills up the uh, foreign reserves, uh, you know, up to a point where there's always a bit of a crisis, but it's not that uh, alarming. And, and this year with uh, the extreme drought uh, in the summer, uh, so summer here in the Southern Hemisphere, just like uh, where you, in, in Australia, is um, around November to uh, February. Uh, and uh, it's really uh, hacked into like at least a, a minus 5% uh, of GDP, uh, basically that, that's not gonna come in uh, with the uh, dollars uh, that they were hoping for. Um, so that is already a blow. And then of course we have general economic slowdown, um, more taxation, uh, all sorts of um, policies where they try to uh, uh, get people away from the dollar as much as possible and, and the companies. So one of the things that they did last month, or no, that was actually two weeks ago. See, things seem like months, but it's, <laughs> it's really... <laughs> time, is, time is just distorted. Like I, I was yeah, looking exactly. at the, the, blue, the blue rate um, and it's, I'm not sure. I think it's, uh, it was about 384 uh when i left the country and now it's at what mm -hmm. 460 today uh, opened at four. so yeah the the uh newspapers are quoting uh 363 i think <laughs> the last uh, thing that i saw but actually if you were going down into microcentro and you would try to get dollars they would probably give you uh more uh like uh 474 uh, and in, in the interior of the country, it's always way more because it's harder to get dollars. So uh, yeah. then you can have a difference of at least 10 or 15 pesos. So they're looking at like already 480 more or less or, or more. Um, so it's so really, wow. Yeah, it's, it's, almost... it's like a 20% devaluation uh, of the informal rate in less than a week. And, and I just talking about that time distortion, I realized I've only, I've only been out of the country for a little over a month. And twenty percent of the value of the currency is has just yeah. evaporated. I mean, it, it, it's in, it's insane. In terms yeah. of let's let's really break it down for people that that mm -hmm. don't perhaps aren't as into this sort of stuff as you or I. So imagine you have a credit card, and people mm -hmm. have to pay their monthly balance, and yes. now people are. What has been happening is you make a certain amount of money, and it's kind of just enough to service the interest every month so you you keep the bank off your back but you never really pay down the principal you never really take any real steps towards your own financial freedom or improving your situation you're working month to month purely just to service the interest at best that essentially uh, is, is kind of what Argentina is in. Now, you mm -hmm. mentioned the soybean crop failure. That, was, that would be analogous to your own work. So if you, you make enough just to service things, things never really improve, but you, you kind of just buy yourself more time to the next month. Now you've yeah. lost 5% of your income, uh, which was your, you know, one of the biggest means of, of getting that income. That's kind of the situation for the country. Let's focus on fiscal policy first and then we'll talk about mm -hmm. why monetary why that makes monetary policy so crazy because they're trying to make up for this black hole that is the the budget deficit 
Yeah. What what is the deficit roughly at the moment for the government? And to whom do they owe this debt? So they own debt denominated in US dollars, which the central yes. bank of Argentina obviously can't print. To whom mm-hmm. do they owe that money and how much is it roughly? And then we'll extrapolate from there. Um, so if you look at it in a percentage of GDP, it's actually not as bad as countries like Italy or the US for that matter. It's, uh, it's still below 100%. Uh, it, I, I think it hovers around uh, 80, 80, 90% right now. So if you, if you were to see like, you know, what's going on, you would, see, you would say like, oh, but, you know, that's not even as bad as, you know, some uh, countries out there that, you know, that haven't gone through this. Uh, but that's where all the other elements come into play because it doesn't really matter uh, f- uh, because the, uh, the other deficits that they run in the country are so huge. So basically, if you look at the foreign, foreign debt and the overall debt, it's, you know, it's, it's about that number. If you look at the internal debt, uh, you know, which is basically the peso bonds, that is where they finance most of the government's, uh, you know, doings, and and the uh, foreign, um, the foreign debt goes to either reserves or you know bigger projects, etc. Uh, but those tend to evaporate pretty quickly. Okay, um, so the the local debt denominated in pesos are Argentinian government bonds that they mm-hmm. sell to to finance what social security and government spending. Yeah, social security, government spending, and of course, it's never enough. So they keep issuing more. And the problem is that, and that's why also uh, I always refer to it as a, uh, a peso ponzi yield farm, because that's basically what it is. Um, what you do is uh, if you have a local bank account here, you uh, can lock up your pesos for uh, the minimum is 30 days. And uh, if you lock it up for 30 days or more, some, you know, you can lock it up for a year if you want to, <laughs> would recommend it. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, uh, then you can get uh, the uh, highest interest rate. So that's like, uh, I think right now it's at 81%. But if you actually lock it up, uh, uh, then, you know, it's, it's closer to 110, 120. So technically you you're take, breaking You even. take the duration risk that, within yes. that year those those pesos may yes and this is may be our a de- personal devaluation event yeah and and this is our personal or the national uh futures gap uh of the uh if you look at i don't know if you're familiar with this but in crypto uh the uh, gme futures gap for bitcoin always closes uh, which means that the futures gap uh, price sometimes uh, diverges from the real market price in, in Bitcoin. And at least for the last couple of years, ever since the futures came along in Chicago, uh, at a certain point, there was just like, boom, uh, the price would either go up or down. Depending on that, what, what happened there, that gap that always closed uh, on the market uh, at some point. Between and that's the spot what, price and the expected futures. Yes, and, and that's that's what's that's what's happening now. Here is basically with this blue uh, rate run, which is the uh, you know the illegal uh, dollar rate, but actually the only dollar you can get here because they're so uh, controlled. Uh, that gap is closing, and uh, so basically, unless you uh, put your pesos in a in this uh, yield farm for a year, you would still have made money unless the uh, blue dollar rate would be at uh, 480 more or less. So it's almost there. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard for most people to understand how you can be receiving, what, like uh, nearly 100% interest rate uh, payment yeah. to you and still be losing purchasing power over time. That yes. gives you an indication as to the, the degradation of that. Um, yeah of the of the and, I, and, I, and I, I, would, I do it sometimes when I, I know like okay i have a couple of uh, payments coming up or whatever next month and uh, i just lock up uh, uh something and it's just like for spending purposes and i don't feel like changing more dollars in the future then i put it in you know a 30 day sure. i did that this i did that this time uh last month or a month and a half ago and i thought like okay now they just ranked up the rates so you know they got everybody ramped up okay let's put it in 30 days max because after those 30 days are over everybody's going to swap to dollars and that's basically what's happening 
And that's why the rate uh, is climbing so quickly because everybody's doing that uh, because they don't trust that, you know, blocking it up for an additional 30 days would actually result in a, a better performance. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who haven't read Mara's amazing Substack or understand the history of Argentina, 2001, you saw a devaluation event. Previously, the dollar was, uh, the peso was pegged to the US dollar. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about the man, your mate, Javier Millet, who wants to do that again. Mm -hmm. um, and so imagine you've got uh, a million pesos in, in the bank account that's pegged one to one, that all things being equal would equal 1 million US dollars in value. And then things happen. You get a devaluation event of one to three or one to four, I think it even was. And the next day you wake up and your million pesos is only worth 330,000 or 250,000 US dollars. So you lose 75% of your purchasing power overnight, um, which is why people don't want to keep their money in the bank because they've, they've learned from the past that you had this duration risk you may be getting paid a lot of interest, but the longer you leave those pesos in the bank account, uh, the more you're at risk of of having some sort of rug pull like that. So here, there, now we've talked about local monetary policy and the fiscal deficits. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about 52% of the, the workforce in Argentina are either not working, not producing, or are employed in the government. So what does that mean? That means that you've got to raise more taxes to pay for mm -hmm. these public servants because that's where they get paid from the government coffers. And where does the government yeah. get that money from? Taxes. But yeah. these, these jobs, they may be important or they may not, depending on your point of view. But they, one thing they don't do is bring in foreign capital or create value. Yes. Ex explain to me, the, or to, the, to all of us, the importance of the social social situation where you have 52% of the workforce employed in the public. And yeah. historically speaking, that's just, that's just like a, a one way track to, to ruin. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I always um, uh, compare it to uh, a snake eating its own tail because basically you're eating away your own resources and there's not coming, you know, there's nothing additional coming in. It's the same pie. And that's basically what's what's happening with Argentina, uh, where they have a lot of social programs. They have a lot of, um, uh, you know, em employment in the government, which, you know, is not really necessary. <coughs> um, and, uh, for example, if you if you see what when they were the richest country on Earth, right, which is 1900, more or less, they had about uh, one or two advisors per senator. So that's about, you know, 150, 200 people max. Mm -hmm. Today, they have about 34 advisors per senator. Uh, and that's across the board everywhere. It's so colossal <laughs> how this thing has grown out of proportion. And the only time that it actually went down a little bit was during the 90s where they started privatizing and, you know, uh, cutting down on a lot of the government spending which is also the time when they uh, peg the peso to the dollar one-to-one, -one, uh, which we'll come back to here in a bit. But um, uh, yeah, right now it's, it's just uh, completely unsustainable. And I understand, you know, I have a Marxist kind of background. I studied uh, literature in, in the Netherlands. I have, uh, you know, my, my background is not in marketing and all the things that I do on the internet. Uh, that I make my money uh, from now, just because I, I moved to Argentina and noticed that I need to do something online because here I'm never going to make it if I, if I am employed in the local economy. Yeah, um, it's, a treadmill to, it's a treadmill to know to know we're good. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's basically uh, you know it, it's the it's the only way uh, to to do it here, uh, unfortunately, because you know I did try with uh, local companies, etc., but it just uh, it's too damn uh, hard for the return you're getting from it. So um, until the situation changes again, like it did in the '90s, then you can have like a pretty decent bull run, and uh, you know a, a, a real growth. Where you know a lot of people see that as a very negative period. Um, that's why they started yeah. voting for these people. Yeah, because surprising. at the same time. Uh, unemployment was high, relatively. Things were very expensive uh, for Argentine uh, standards. People were making about the same amount in dollars that they are making now. Uh, 400, 500 was like the, the minimum salary. And um, 
Yeah, uh, but at the same time, a lot of middle-class families did really, you know, they purchased property, they were able to fly to Miami every year. So there were a lot of uh, people that did uh, uh, find that a really good period. But for example, my wife's family, she's from a very humble family, and they had a really, really rough time in the 90s. And she really hates that period because of that. Um, And, you know, so I can really understand from that perspective and when i first came here that was my point of view oh the you know the whole socialist kind of thing is, is great because that will you know uh, give people that are not uh, in the system uh, more possibility to uh, <coughs> to actually you know get by etc but it's just turned into this uh, giant monster and i've it's, become more and yeah. more libertarian as, as the years gone by because uh, you know, if you live in Western Europe and you read it in the in the history books and um, you read Marx, et cetera, and, and academic papers, it's all nice and it sounds nice because you're in one of the most uh, fucking open open economies in the world yeah, exactly. and you can philosophize about that exactly. and it doesn't really right. touch you. It puts so, you in the position where you can have all these great ideas of the fact that you had a, it, a you had a free market to work with. And exactly. And too, so we've seen this, this peronismo and this socialism uh, with the unique argentine qualities that just the importance of that is it just continues to compound the debt or the deficit uh, between Mm -hmm. what the government earns and what the government owes so the more you give to people who are not uh, perfectly good people of course but they're not producing uh, an ability to to service that debt the gap just grows it comes back to you uh, my example the credit card your balance on the credit card just keeps growing now here's the thing when it comes to monetary policy that we're going to transition to is that you uh, if you're a government and you owe that debt in the um, in your local currency what happens time and time again is that the central bank then just prints up more currency in order to service the debt the problem yeah. with that the debt continues to grow because politicians and people don't learn the lesson they just think oh well we've got free stuff let's vote for more free stuff the debt grows to pay for that free stuff and how do they do that they print more money what happens to the value of that currency and if i share my screen with people so that they get an idea here we we are we're only going back to uh 2018 <laughs> And you can see yeah. the value of the peso versus the US yeah. dollar. It's lost 90% of its purchasing power. Yeah. And, and this is the official rate, by the way. So that's anybody, exactly. yeah. And then this is always the thing when, you know, whenever I post prices on Twitter, it's always going to be like, no, but, you know, the real rate uh, or the price is actually this in dollars. It's like, no, because yeah. there's a parallel market. And, you know, that, that is not the real dollar that you're going to get here. Correct. And so if you look back uh, since 2004, the peso has officially lost no the currency's died basically in less than 20 years you yeah. lost 98.67 percent of the value why because of the printing the selling uh, or issuing of government bonds to pay for these social programs so that's why the debt is important the politics of that are very important because the this the policies or people's voting preferences will lead to increasing that debt for you mentioned it sounds good to have the these social programs but someone's got to pay for it and all that happens is the government debt increases the government has to service that debt in their local currency which mm-hmm. then dies because of the amount of printing now we're exactly. going to transition to the other side of the coin because argentina also owes debts on money that it cannot print so it owes dollar denominated debt uh in your article here uh, the coin market talking about the fascinating history of quasi monedas here we're taking a look at the imf uh, debts where argentina's reserves are supposed to be <laughs> and then yeah lol where they actually are let's talk a little bit about <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. laugh about, we laugh about this but i mean if, if you were a bank and this was yeah. your client and you had all your covenants in place and you saw this and you say, look, you're supposed to have this amount here and this is what you and actually you're there. have. Yeah. I, I, yeah you... I mean, that's, that, that's basically, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a junk bond or, or worse, you know, it's like the worst client you can have. You would never, ever lend more money to this, to this person. And that's basically think. what the, basically what the IMF is doing is still lending money to Argentina because they already have the highest loan or the biggest loan ever uh, by the IMF. Yeah. So 
uh, when was it 2018 they got the 60 billion dollar yeah. loan and so again if you're a bank and this is where your client's supposed to be I, like this is <laughs> this is a default waiting to happen one thing you don't yeah. do is keep loaning them money like this is this is never going to change with you continuing to no. loan the money so i mean this is this this is quite insane where else does Argentina owe money? So they owe the IMF still another what sixty billion. Um, obviously yeah, that's probably like, more with interest. Uh, and, yeah, you know, that's also draining the reserves. So it's not that it's not doing anything because you know I had some uh, threads on Twitter where I said like, look, it's not just the IMF. It's a really uh, radical spending spree, and uh, you know they will blame it on the IMF, but actually the uh, maturities they've kicked them. You know they've restructured so many times that they could. You know this government doesn't even touch the maturities uh, of uh, any of those installments. They're just paying interest, which you know is a couple billion every month, or one, one, one and a half, eight hundred million. You know things like that. Uh, uh, so it does uh, affect the foreign reserves, but at the same time, it's not like they, you know, they're supposed to pay back fifteen billion uh, in one go or something, which would completely wreck. The, I mean, that's not it. even there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I couldn't do that. Yeah, which leads me to the next uh, interesting happening of the uh, recently, which is. Did the central bank run out of reserves? And so it started dipping in and taking those dollars out of the commercial banks? Um, so yeah, that's uh, one thing that uh, a lot of analysts have been uh, monitoring for the last three months. Uh, it's basically run out of liquid reserves, uh, the central bank, and, and they publish these uh, stats. So anybody can see that, so including the IMF. And apparently the IMF doesn't care too much. Uh, and uh, of course, these... Uh, you have the passive and active there, et cetera. But still, they are selling every single day. They're selling all these millions of dollars in reserves to keep a sort of, you know, uh, fake peg that doesn't exist uh, of 200 something uh, pesos per dollar yeah. um, on the official rate. Uh, but they have to sell a lot of reserves for that all the time. Um, now, the reserve, the liquid reserves, uh, they ran out of that, and then they're about minus six billion right now. Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring there. up the graphic so, here of yeah. Uh, so March 26, <clears throat> you posted this: the central banks are negative 5.13 billion dollars, uh, which means then they have to continue to find these dollars somehow every month to to service their foreign debts, and so it looks like they've been dipping into the reserves of the commercial banks to to satisfy that i mean yeah so the, basically that is uh is the big worry and today there was already a, a mini bank run uh, where a lot of people went and tried to take the money out uh the dollars um of course uh, and consumers they uh, went through the 2001 crisis where basically the peg fell from uh one to three to the dollar so basically, uh, nobody could take their money out back then. They said, like, okay, we have to devaluate, and you're only going to get 33 cents of every dollar you deposit. Um, so uh, a lot of people, um, the majority doesn't uh, store their uh, USD on local uh, banks because of that. You would be insane now, they, to do that. You'd yeah. be insane to do that. But there's a lot of, you know, commercial activity and uh, companies that don't have a choice. You know, if you're an importer, exporter, you have to do everything officially and you have to use uh, that bank account. And those are all official rates, et cetera. And it's, you know, it's a real nightmare. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have to use it. So it's still like a lot of billions of dollars are stored in that official system together with all the uh, what's called cuenta comitentes of the uh, exchanges. So, you know, if, if I want to buy dollars uh, or not dollars, but, uh, you know, bonds or stocks or whatever, um, internationally here, there's a couple of uh, brokers that uh, uh, provide that service. And all those, uh, you know, dollars, et cetera, they're also stored on that same system. So uh, there's still like quite a bit of dollars in the banking system. That they so can this, dip, is a, uh, this is essentially capital controls in another form because you you have to keep the you have to keep those dollars in accounts to which the the central bank apparently has access. So there's no escaping it if you have to run an no. official business from inside the country, right? 
No, and especially in the official business that really has to deal with, because if it's services, you know, you can circumvent that. And I explained that uh, in some Twitter threads where, you know, you can declare basically what you need to declare and that's it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, official businesses where they deal with agro and commodities and so they, they don't have a choice. You're, you're toast. Yeah. Exactly. So, and, you know, those amounts are way bigger. And, you know, the worst thing is for them is that they also have to liquidate at a uh, very uh you know bad rates uh the government tried to to uh, make it more appealing to liquidate soy for example for the producers that uh hadn't exported yet and they gave them a better dollar rate at 300 but they still decided not to liquidate and said like look we're not going to export if it's only 300 while the blue rate is at you know almost 500 mm -hmm. uh, because uh you know besides uh and and this is where the uh, annoying argument always comes in in terms of politics where uh, you know the left uh, will say like look all these bad producers and they just want the max for their for their uh, crops etc and they're fucking over the whole country uh, but at the same time you know thinking about them all the effort that has gone into uh, you know uh, creating that and that's basically private property uh they can export that at the price that they want to um but they can't because of these capital controls so they have to take the price that the uh, argentine government says they will give them and then after that after getting like a, a worse rate uh, uh, than the real dollar rate they're also taxed uh up to 60 percent uh withholding tax so basically if you run the numbers, it's almost uh, you almost go negative by being a producer here. So it's it makes no sense at all, and that's why also uh, also Argentina compared to Brazil has really gone down the drain uh, for you know all kinds of agricultural production, just because um, uh, you know they, it just doesn't make sense to invest if uh, the government takes so much out of what you produce. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if that doesn't change and, uh, you know, the IMF um, doesn't say anything about those retentions or uh, withdrawal taxes, uh, they actually are pushing for more taxation, which, you know, is also inflationary because, uh, you know, that just drives up prices. Of so course, I don't really yeah, the, see... the argument, the argument from the left would be, well, we need more taxes to service the debt. And then one might stop and ask the question, well, who is, who has led to this debt being so, um, so gigantic in the first place? And it's been these, these leftist government policies. Uh, so if we, yeah. if, if, well, we, that, if we that, and that's been, the, that, that's been the, the last 20 years, but before that, of course, in the, uh, we shouldn't forget the nineties where there was a much more, uh, what they call here neoliberal policies. But, you know, if you look at the, the facts, it was basically friends of the government running these companies, et cetera. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, Latin Americanisms going on there where it wasn't really, uh, open capitalism as we know it in some other places. Um, but in, in that period, at the end, uh, you know, they got the tequila crisis in 98, which really affected Argentina. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the deficits were running higher at the end of the, uh, the term. Uh, they, you know, they, they also had a debt problem, but it was like a different kind of debt problem, uh, which was solved pretty quickly because there was enough liquidity. Uh, so even they just had to depeg the peso uh, because they were just printing too much money uh, to maintain that peg. peg and then everything was basically fine but they had you know everybody got a 60 percent haircut basically which is you know not uh, for the faint at heart uh, but it's, it's so a the, different the, situation yeah yeah the the 89 onwards period uh, when they decided to peg the dollar uh, initially quite painful but uh, got to the point where things were quite good from a purchasing parity perspective for the citizens the problem was in the meantime the government kept running up these debts and had to print pesos to cover those debts. And eventually, because you had printed, uh, essentially Argentina had outprinted the US in terms of printing more pesos, way more pesos than dollars. Obviously, if you have three times as much of something versus something else, you, you can't maintain a peg because there's obviously a, mitch, a mismatch. And so they had to then devalue to make up the difference. Uh, in speculating, what would have mm -hmm. happened in theory, if they hadn't been so stupid and run up all these debts, they could have kept the peg, right? Is that is that the way? You well, see 
Yeah, I think because of the because of the crisis, uh, it, it was uh, really hard to maintain the peg. Uh, and uh, I th at that time, I think they just wanted to avoid uh, a recession or a really bad recession, and that's why they started to run up a deficit. But um, yeah, it's it's just really really tough because now if you have somebody like Millet, uh, which is like the libertarian candidate right now, and they have. Um, you know, he has about, you know, 25% max uh, of the votes. Uh, I, you know, that's the, what the polls are saying. For people watching on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. here is the, yeah. the man himself, Javier Millet, yeah. uh, the Libertarian candidate, uh, has what, roughly, the polls have him at 20% support? Yeah, 20, 25. Uh, 25. So, but I, I don't really know. For a Libertarian what's... candidate, like in the US, oh, definitely. Get yeah, 2 to 3%. And he's an he's an out, total outsider, so he doesn't really have a political infrastructure. And every, uh, he's a well-known economist. He showed up on uh, TV a lot. Uh, he's like sort of a celebrity in that sense. So he already had a lot of airtime, and um, and then he decided to be a candidate. And uh, now he's running on this, you know, dollarization, um, uh, the dollarize uh, campaign. He basically wants to get rid of the central bank. And he wants just to Argentina to use dollars like Ecuador and Panama. So that's different than using a peg where, uh, mm -hmm. as in the nineties, where they still had access to a printer, uh, to maintain that peg. And then he wants to take that completely away. Away. That's going to make um, him very unpopular. In, very unpopular. In the uh, it, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So let's segue into that. So we've got elections coming up in November. The primaries are in a couple of months, I believe. Uh, who are the main candidates for each party on the left, on the right? And then we have this guy here with the amazing hairstyle on the, well, libertarian is really neither of the two. Where do yeah, I, I would say he, he's kind of a mix. He's become kind of a mix of the uh, uh, libertarians uh, plus the uh, sort of neocons because he does adopt like more of a conservative narrative as well, which is not that libertarian uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, any kind of social issues. So there he goes more like uh, more on the Catholic stance okay. just to get those votes, I think. Okay, so... Uh social let's call it socially uh those sorts of, of issues he's more conservative then when it comes to well clearly a monetary policy it sounds to me very much like he's from the austrian school of uh, hard money um yeah and then fiscal policy also sounds conservative uh in terms of reigning in the budget deficit and when you look at where these taxes go i mean this is the, uh <laughs> You and I were laughing yeah. about this offline. Like, this is where the, the taxes go in Argentina. You wonder why people uh, do their best to avoid paying taxes. Like this is in the middle of a crisis, um, president using the presidential helicopter to give an interview about uh, <laughs> who, who might play, who might play his role if they were to make a movie about him. Um, like what? <laughs> what is going on <laughs> yeah i mean and th that's why i always say like there's never a boring moment in uh in argentina it's just, yeah hence your he, hence your coffee cup yeah exactly you never get bored here uh, it's it's seriously crazy and then another thing that happened that you're showing right now here yeah. is uh the iron mountain which is uh, a security uh company very important one uh, for keeping, you know, a safekeeping of documents, uh, all sorts of financial documents of banks uh, and government documents. Now, in 2014, they also had a fire uh, out of nowhere. Very strange. And then uh, all sorts of investigations had to stop because all those documents burnt down. And uh, basically, yeah, uh, basically that happened today uh, while we were in the middle of this um you know, uh, currency crisis, basically, uh, which the government doesn't acknowledge whatsoever. I mean, Christina, the vice president, she was just tweeting about how she's going to do a masterclass about how wonderful her uh, husband's government was uh, when he took office. So, I mean, there's no recognition of what is going on. I mean, it is seriously uh, schizophrenic at this point. Um, I mean, the, the uh, director of the central bank, uh, the president of the central bank, he did go to the Casa Rosada today to talk with uh, Fernandez. Uh, but there no, has been no official statement of what came out of that meeting. 
Uh, now I am in some uh, more you know deeper financial circles here, and uh, basically the rumors are that if uh, they want access to more F, uh, IMF capital, they're going to have to devaluate 60% uh, the official rate, at least. Um, and other, and the, the risks of hyperinflation are very real uh, right now. Uh, and in a couple of weeks, the bank, the central bank may run out of reserves completely. Uh, so right now, they're sort of able to wing it, but that's not going to happen uh, for, a, for a whole lot longer. That's why they also announced this bank holiday on Friday and, and today. Uh, it's basically withdraw. because... No, it's it's not a bank holiday. Uh, sorry, it's a it's a it, it's a foreign currency uh, holiday from the central bank. So basically, there's no settlements, so no imports and exports can be settled. Uh, no dollars can be exchanged there. So that's basically what they did. Because we <laughs> because we suspect that they don't have these dollars. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. So are we? I know we're jumping around here, but it's just just too crazy. Yeah. Are we like? <laughs> weeks away from this either devaluation or new currency we'll talk about that is it going to be a deval is it going to be a new currency not a lot of difference between the two in reality uh, but yeah. then and then we'll come back to why that why this is potentially a, a landmark moment in argentine history if you've got someone who actually has the support to abolish the central bank and say this has not worked we are going in this direction it's going to suck um but we need to we need to go there how, how far away is this deval well currency? this deval uh basically last uh, thursday and uh there was this uh, big um uh portfolio company that was already saying like look on monday they're going to announce a big devaluation now that brought all sorts of chaos in the market and basically the government is now suing that company uh, because they probably got the word somewhere and they decided to communicate that to their clients and make it pu public. And that's after that, the uh, central bank announced those two, uh, uh, you know, foreign exchange holidays, um, <clears throat> those two days. Uh, and they haven't made any announcements today because according to that uh, company, uh, the portfolio company, it, it should have been today that they announced the uh, devaluation and they didn't. Uh, I think because it leaked and uh, they decided not to, but it, it, that can happen any day now because you know that's not uh, not uh, weird given the fact that also the central bank president he went to the Casa Rosada to talk about this probably you know what needs to be done when are we going to say this? Uh, so I suspect that it's going to be any moment now or. Um, and, and it gets really political at this point because uh, you have to think about the long-term strategy. Uh, these people have been in power for uh, almost uninterruptedly since 2003. Um, before, in the 90s, it was not a different party because Menem was also a Peronist, but he was a right-wing Peronist. Uh, he, he also ran for office in the uh, 2002 elections, and he uh, won actually, after the whole crisis, he still won. And then he decided to uh, not run for president anymore. And then Kirchner uh, became president with only 23% of the votes. Uh, so the Christina fact that or Nesta? The, her, her husband, so uh, her, her husband, uh, uh, he uh, basically got the presidency from Menem because Menem didn't want it anymore. Uh, so that's how his presidency started in that whole chaos, because it was like a really chaotic period because they were, you know, in that whole uh, crisis back then. And he, you know, it was 10% growth year over year at that point because they came out of the hole. So, it, you know, it was really easy to print those numbers. Uh, and then uh, Christina, uh, his wife, ran two governments. And then it became more and more, uh, you know, uh, deficit spending, et cetera. It just went worse and worse in that sense. Um, and then Macri uh, became uh, president. So he was like sort of the opposition. But at the same time, he was so gradual uh, in his approach that he ended up doing more or less the same thing, but with more money from the IMF, paying off the old loans that, uh, uh, you know, Christina never wanted to touch. There was this uh, vulture fund that bought up a percentage of the old IMF loans that uh, Argentina during her presidency did not recognize and didn't want to pay. 
And then I think, as soon uh, as if, if anyone's been to El Calafate and they see Christina's uh, lovely compound down there, I think I'm, I think I may <laughs> know. I think I may know where some of those funds ended up. Just saying, it's a it's a lovely house she's got down there. Yeah, and apparently it's booked every single night. Uh, every it's fully booked, and there's never any people there. It's so strange. That's so that's strange. one of the. <laughs> These things just happen in Argentina. You have a fire yeah. conveniently where all the bank records are located. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that so that happened today, and uh, when it happened in 2014, that was under uh, Christina's government. Uh, they also defaulted on one uh, bond payment. Uh, uh, so that was in the same year. And this year, I think we're really close to default. Uh, the same uh, Iron Mountain company goes up in flames. So a lot of uh, documents are lost. Um, I'm not sure, like it's mainly the servers. So you don't, you, you shouldn't think about this as, you know, uh, a lot of paper lying around there. It's actually the financial records that are stored there on servers, et cetera. Uh, and what happened in the last two weeks has been just like a, a blatant manipulation by uh, Sergio Massa, uh, the uh, Minister of Economy, uh, in the whole bond market it's been up and down and it, it, it it's been trading like a shit coin with volumes that have never ever been seen and that's only a government that can you know, produce that kind of volumes <laughs> basically i think they want to erase that part of the the history so that's gone now it's what it went up in flames and uh <laughs> so here we are uh there, and here, here we come with the political part because uh, what i think can happen is uh, uh one they do not want to devaluate because that's that's like the worst scenario in in the this government's mind and you know in the previous ones that are of this uh, same lineage is like the worst thing you can do is devaluate because that really uh, fucks up the purchasing power of these people because they don't recognize the the fake dollar or the illegal dollar you know that in their minds that is something that most people don't have access to so they don't know about it so it doesn't impact their lives that much it doesn't matter that uh, the la nation the, it doesn't matter the and, main yeah, newspaper that, of the country has the has the quote every day on the front exactly page. They oh just, and they they actually called the newspapers last friday oh, saying like no. please could you stop updating the quotes because uh, everybody's going crazy um uh, but basically what, what you're if what I were the newspaper I'd say can you please stop running up this fucking debt so we don't have to quote it yes, we can just have exactly. one currency but you know it serves their narrative because then they can say like look at all these bad uh, entrepreneurs that keep ranking up their oh, prices yes. where they don't uh, recognize that you know there's an excess of uh, pesos that nobody wants uh, and basically right. that keeps getting uh, higher and higher and the peso uh, just uh, devaluates you need to uh, crank up your pricing and that's what basically what happens uh, and and what's going to happen even more now i think we're really going to go to 200 300% soon with what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. And that does impact everybody's lives. But then it's the entrepreneur's fault or the bad companies because they keep uh, yeah, raising their price prices. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's not so like it's they it's have typical to. Marxist argument where, you know, it's 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 their fault. You know, you see it even in the US, but here it's like uh, even worse. So what I think is they don't want to uh, get off that narrative maybe and say like, okay, uh, we're going to hand in the, the you know, we're going to step down and we're going to do early elections and then the next guy can do it. And then we can say, and we can run on four years of saying like, look at how look bad, what, yeah. look what he has done, yeah. you know, and then it's his fault basically. And I think that that's one um, a strategy they could implement. Yeah. Because the other one is a like a devaluation, a devaluation is, is them uh, admitting that the entrepreneur is not at fault because the entrepreneur exactly. is just they're raising their prices in able in order just to keep up with the devaluation and so if you officially devalue you, you're essentially saying that they were correct the whole time i remember speaking yeah. to a guy who sells doors um like big doors in country clubs in, in buenos aires and i said like how often do you have to raise your prices and he says every month at the moment normally by about seven percent and He's if in case you're you're listening to this thinking that he's making he's increasing his profit margins by seven percent every month. No, he's just doing that to stay even. And this is the point: when the government is saying, "Look at this guy; he's raising his prices every month because he's price gouging," and he's saying, "No, you clowns have run up deficits, printed all these pesos by the central bank, and what I earn is losing purchasing power every month by seven percent. I have to do this." 
just to, just to break even. Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Leading to this yeah. idea of we've got Millet, he wants to dollarize, not peg, but he wants to dollarize, um, mm -hmm. which means the government obviously would not be able to print up the difference. How would that, how would that look if I bring up this graphic? So long term, you and I tend to agree that this would probably be a good thing. If you look at where, well, it can't be any worse, right? If you look yeah, at exactly. where this has been implemented in Ecuador and Panama, we're looking at minimum salary. So minimum salary in Ecuador is equal roughly to $600 US per month, I would imagine that is. Uh, is mm -hmm. that correct? And at the moment, that's the median or the, the mean salary in Argentina. So essentially, yeah. um, Essentially, that would be a huge uplifting of, um, of, of wages, right? Of living standards. Um, but how, how would this work? How are you going to now dollarize this economy? Let's, let's say this guy wins. And let's yeah. say <clears throat> he is able to do what he wants to do. He gets an alliance with the, I would imagine, center right, because he's not going to get mm -hmm. the votes on his own. They say, yep, fine. We're going to dollarize this economy. Um, more like Ecuador because Panama technically has the Balboa, which is a, a twin currency, but everything runs on dollars. Um, yeah. How, what would that mean for people who currently hold pesos? Will it be a devaluation to 800 to one? That's what I've seen you write. If you look at. Um, yeah. So owe... there's been a couple of, uh, uh, of consultants that, that have made a prediction or sort of balancing out, you know, at what price would it be uh, doable without requesting more foreign uh, investment or more uh, foreign loans. And that would be right now around uh, 800, 900, but others, uh, that other all? predictions that low. Uh, how it they... seems low. I've, I've seen other predictions that go as high as 2000 uh, yeah. pesos. I think that's more, you know, what's probably likely to, to happen. Okay. And are they, well, so... there, there's no, there's no, still no real, uh, I mean, uh, Millet is uh, an economist, but at the same time, there's no real plan yet behind the dollar, how he's going to dollarize in practice. So there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a whole can of worms that, that he's going to have to go through besides the legal issues, because I think legally uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be really hard here to, to, to get that uh, press through to take away the peso as a, as a, for, as a, you know, currency of the country and replace it with the dollar. I think that's going to be the, 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 you know, the hardest thing besides all the opposition, because basically even the opposition right now, the official opposition, which is the pro, uh, which is governing in, um, in the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, and then they basically vote everything in favor of, of the current government. They're not really opposition. They basically keep the, the, each other in power and they sort of do the same thing. So Millet is really an outsider in that sense. And they also don't want to dollarize. Now, there's one uh, other candidate, which is Bullrich, and she is part of the pro, uh, but she is more of like a, a you know, a way more right wing uh, part of the pro, that same uh, opposition party, and she's running on her own. Uh, and uh, she already indicated that she would be interested in joining forces with Millet. And she is a much more nuanced character for a lot of people to vote on. So a lot of, you know, uh, middle class people already said, like, I would vote uh, for Bullrich, but Millet is kind of a whack job, so I wouldn't vote for him. So I think if they would join uh, forces or maybe in the internal uh, elections in August where they define the candidates, that's basically the pre-elections. If they, uh, Millet already said, like, I wouldn't be against uh, running together and then see who gets uh, uh, to be the candidate. And then, you know, in I will just primaries. help uh, or, you know, you can help me mm -hmm. in the primary. So uh, we'll see how that turns out. It's not been official yet. But if that's the case, I mean, that's the, the most bullish scenario, because if they would work together, I think they actually have a really big chance of winning because uh, they already uh, would have uh, such a high percentage of votes. Because in Argentina, you need more than 50% of the votes. Okay. Uh, now, of course, nobody's going to get that in the first uh, turnaround. But then afterwards, you just do the ballotage between the, the two that are left. And then in that case, if it's uh, you know, either Bullrich and Millet against one of the current government's uh, candidates, I mean, they don't stand a chance, I think, in that scenario. 
And why is it? okay? So is that like the in the US, Georgia, the state of Georgia has this um, runoff where you, you have to get at least 50%. And if you don't initially, then it takes the two highest polling candidates and pits them against each other. Is that what happens here? Um, but on a party level? Um, yeah, basically, that, that's the, the pre election is basically to define on a party level uh, who is going to run. Who's going to be like, the, the candidate who's going to be the, the ticket, main right? the main candidate on the ticket yeah and then uh, in october there's the final election where uh, people vote for uh, the candidate of each party uh, and then you have uh, you know the uh, the the second round if there's no uh, definitive answer then you know they go to another uh, round and then it's uh, uh, you know a max of two candidates where the majority wins so okay so why are you saying that if it if they were to get in that scenario, they wouldn't stand a chance. What What do they have to do? No, to no, the the current the current government wouldn't stand a chance. Wouldn't stand a chance. So, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So uh, I think if if it were that scenario where that um, they together uh, get to that point, or maybe one of them, because it's really divided right now, it's basically one third, one third, one third at this moment. Jeez, that's and Millet, it, yeah, and Millet is a little bit uh, more in the twenty five percent range. The others are that in the thirty three. Is... But as long as one of the other parties don't get above fifty percent and he's in second place, then he would he's go to third, that 50, he's, 50 yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, as long so I mean there's real chances here of of a really big shift for Argentina, uh, which is very interesting because it ha hasn't happened for a long while. Uh, well, I mean, with Macri it sort of happened, but then it ended up being more of the same and, and nothing really changed. <laughs> so yeah. And is the I mean, if, if Macri would have done the the shock therapy, he would still be president right now. I mean, he would they would have reelected him. I think it would have been one year of massive pain. Yeah. Uh, and then you know they would be bitching about it all the time, and then afterwards it would just be boom with a rocket ship. Like uh, seriously, but he didn't have to. Well, I don't think he had the political uh, backing to do that. Uh, and they were just scared. Like, okay, we're in this position of power now, and we don't want to fuck it up. So let's try to keep everybody happy. Well, if you have 50, uh, 45, 50% spending already, uh, you know, you can't keep everybody happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and now there's consensus that everybody knows that that's the case. Yeah. It just, uh, you know, all the candidates say they're going to cut somewhere else. And the, you know, the candidate that says, well, there's, there's not really a candidate yet for the official uh, uh, party. I mean, the president just said last week that he's going to step down and he's not going to be a candidate. So we don't have an official candidate yet um, for the uh, ruling uh, party. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> that's 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 bad, that's bad optics. That's bad yeah. politics. <laughs> okay. So we've established that maybe th there is a better than or well, greater than zero chance this guy can win. He wants to dollarize. Does he have to get? No. Oh, presumably, he's got to get support of majority in the in the senate to pass something like that like to abolish the central bank the the whole political ponzi runs on buying votes and what yeah. enables you to buy those votes are with printed pesos and the central mm -hmm. bank is your your personal money printer as a politician to buy your votes and yeah. essentially this is so interesting so he's got to get people to vote to take away this printer that's enabled yes. them to, to buy their votes um how, exactly. is he going to, how is he going to do that? Well, you know, I, I think if he uh, gets to be on the ticket by himself, um, I think he has absolutely no uh, chance of running the country. Uh, I mean, he will, it will be even worse than with Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, where there's just, uh, you know, he has no political infrastructure. Uh, they will just make it impossible for him to govern. And there's no way in hell that he would be able to push something like that through, wouldn't go through the House, wouldn't go through the Senate. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, now, if he runs on the uh, ticket with Bullrich, for example, then there's uh, some more chances. But in that case, I don't think a dollarization will happen at all uh, because she doesn't want want that uh, from what I get. And her party is sort of like in the, uh, in the same way as as the, the current party where they, they like the printer a lot. 
<laughs> yeah, just to buy votes, exactly. It doesn't. I mean, so, if, I, if I had a credit card bill and I could just print my own money to pay my own credit card bill, I'd be doing that too. But Exactly. Uh, it wouldn't I, the other day, I, I, uh, I, po I posted a video uh, of, uh, you know, it's in Spanish, but uh, it, basically what it says is like, uh, there's these uh, front men here during the elections, and they basically try to ramp up as many people as possible, and they pay them to vote for a certain candidate. So they say, like, if you can get your, you know, your husband, your children, et cetera, to vote for this, you can receive more money. And these front men, the amount of people they source, they get paid more and more and more. It's like a commission. And this, so this is like a pyramid scheme all the way up to the politician. Uh, and this all gets funded by, you know, social subsidies. So this basically the taxpayers is funding this whole shit show. And it just keeps on going, you know, and it's really, really bad because these people, for them, it's a lot of money because they're poor, uh, dirt poor, and, and they will vote for whoever they tell them to vote for if they receive, you know, 10,000 pesos to do so. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a tough opposition to beat. Uh, it is, it is, because it's, you know, it's been ingrained in society, and it's been, you know, everybody uh, uh, works in this uh, sort of uh, way, and so there's also... Technically, there's no way of fair elections or democracy just doesn't work in Argentina in that sense because, yeah. you know, everybody's just buying votes or dropping refrigerators in a favela and then saying like, oh, okay, nice, <laughs> get all your votes. It's too easy to buy votes. And if you're going by majority, then yeah, that's, it's yeah. always going to, it's always going to end that way. It's a problem with the uh, problem. And that, that's why always the, the poorer areas always vote the same. And the, seriously, if you go to La Matanza, for example, which is one of the biggest districts right outside of Buenos Aires, um millions and millions of people living there and some uh, most of the streets are still they don't even have asphalt or whatever and they always vote peronism it's because you know because of this structure they never and they're always the deciding vote in the end you know always the election if it's like uh really close the uh, the district that decides the the win is that district <laughs> because there's just so many people concentrated there and it always tips in their favor it's like yeah. fuck <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's crazy in terms of so in theory what are the chances of maybe the chances of dollarization maybe it's more of a fantasy than something that will ever come to pass but what if it did like what would that why would that be a good thing at the end of the day uh what would that mean in the short term if we're talking about uh, even an official deval to 800 that's still a 100% devaluation from what the pesos currently were. Uh, if we go to probably where you and I think it's more likely to be 2000, that's basically a, you know, you, your money in the bank one day would be worth 20% the next day uh, if you were to, to save it in pesos. So how, how will they work out a dollarized economy? Will they be using resources in the ground? And does that mean they'll have to sell resources uh, how the hell would he make this happen? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, I've seen some formulas, et cetera, but it's still not really convincing. Um, and I've seen some other economists like completely uh, break it down and say like, dude, this guy doesn't know what he's going to do. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, there's there's been a coordinated media effort to really uh, try to, uh, uh, to, to hit him hard from every single angle, which only gets him more votes because he's in the picture all the time. It's sort of like a Donald Trump story where the media, the only thing they talk about is Millet, which is good. So, you know, it's probably he's going to get a lot more votes just because of that. Uh, and, you know, the whole uh, opposition, everybody's talking about him all the time and how ridiculous it is to dollarize. So basically that dollarization has now more likelihood of, of coming to pass just because everybody's talking about it. Yeah. And people start to think about, you know, nice. what that might uh, mean for their lives. And um, I think in the end, uh, you know, we'll bring a lot more stability, et cetera. The thing is like how to implement this. And especially from a judicial uh, perspective, I have no clue how that would work because, you know, the bureaucracy in this country is just seriously insane. It's like in Italy and Spain on steroids. Oh my God. And if, if, you, if you want to, um, you know, push something like this through and basically why nobody does things by the book is because everything is so complicated. So basically everybody just says, yeah, fuck it. I'll just do it, you know, off the books and I'll just do it my way. And that, you know, uh, luckily that is possible in Argentina because nobody uh, cares about it and there's not that much state oversight 
over things. It's and it's also in the place, let's be honest. That, that's why we love the place and that's yeah. why it's such a nice place to live. Um, but yeah, if you, if you really want to push that through, I mean, it could also mean uh, a complete restructuring, which is, that would be my uh, favorite view because basically in, in the Netherlands, for example, what they did was from the 80s onwards was whenever you implement a new law, you have to cut two in the same segment. Uh, to not overproduce laws and make everything, and basically here it's law on top of law on top of law. Uh, if you were if you were to pay those exactly, government employees something to do, exactly. If you if you as a local company were to pay every th- single tax by the letter, which are all superimposed, etc., on top of each other, layered and whatever, uh, so you're paying multiple taxes over the same amount, etc., uh, you would go bankrupt. It's basic. It, it would amount to about 116 percent over profits. So I mean. That's why nobody in his right mind will ever do things by the book here because it's just, it's just already it's, completely it's, it's screwed. Arithmetically yeah. impossible to do. It's yeah. it's yeah exactly. Everybody will go bankrupt. So, um, you know, dollarization might give uh, a good opportunity to just completely redo that. But then you, of course, you probably need to change the constitution. You would need to, and for that, you really need like everybody on board because yeah. Yeah. that is just not going to happen. Uh, especially not with Millet, who's a very volatile character. He's, he's you know, really quite a persona and sort of more like, a, you know, really, he's really comparable to Trump and Bolsonaro in a way where he's really mediatic and, uh, you know, everybody, uh, once the camera's on him, you know, he always says something funny or whatever. Yeah. People love him. Like he goes to all these, these little cities in the interior and, and there's crowds and crowds around him, which is very positive. Uh, But at the same time, like the viability long term of this and his political backing really makes me doubt if it's going to go anywhere besides, you know, maybe a little bit more open economy, which is, you know, for me, that would already be a a great step forward compared to what we have now. Yeah, Yeah, interesting to see the formula of how we would would dollarize. Would that, but what would that mean for guys like you and I that enjoy going to Argentina for that currency arbitrage, you've been living there mm-hmm. for a long time. Uh, if there would, if things were to dollarize, would that reduce? Yeah, everything would be a lot more expensive. expensive. Basically, yeah. if you yeah, if you look at uh, and that's that's technically for you know what Argentina offers, that should be the case. Right now, it's on a discount, and it's been like that for maybe ten years plus. Huge discount. It's insanely cheap. And the standard of living is very high, and you know, uh, for us consumes, that is uh, not for Argentine citizens. Oh, exactly on a, on a dollar standard, of course. Uh, so uh, you know, if you have money here in in foreign currency, you're just king of the hill, and uh, that has been the case for the ten plus years. Uh, and you know, the last three four years, it's just been completely nuts. I mean, if you if you have two thousand three thousand uh and if you have five thousand plus here i mean you can't even spend that money here it really it's really hard <laughs> it's crazy yeah. yeah so i mean that would basically mean that it would go back more to like a 90s model where uh the argentines have more purchasing power uh also in the region you know they could also go to on holiday to uh, more far away places more easily which they can't do now yeah. Uh, and uh, but, you know, from a local perspective in terms of buying power, I'm not sure if that's going to change uh, overnight. That's probably going to take a while. Um, and because in, in the 90s, it, it wasn't like the majority had a lot of spending pow- uh, power um, with the one on one situation. I mean, no, uh, everything they, was really cheap, but yeah, uh, they could at still... least they, they were closer to or well, they were on parity with the US. And I remember um someone i was speaking to saying that he remembers in the 90s it, it, it wasn't um, it was cheap for him to go to the us it's his words yeah um, yeah which is just a like it's just crazy to think about right now like if you if you had pesos and you were trying to go to the us um and make a life or, or just be able to survive um obviously you couldn't do it but you know, less yeah. 30 years ago you you could do it cheaply it's uh crazy well, and, and during that time in the 90s, it was, uh, you know, even though unemployment was relatively high at the end, uh, access to credit, et cetera, was, you know, way more accessible. I mean, right now, there's, there is no credit uh, here, which is also why if you show up with a bag of cash, you can basically get a lot of deals because everybody needs money. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, cash. Uh, which leads us into, let's 
uh, update. Last time we spoke about real estate, uh, some of the mm -hmm. interesting things that you were doing. Uh, you and I caught up in March in Visha Crepo where we had Aperol spritz. And I can't remember everything <laughs> that we, we spoke about. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what's happening with the real estate market in terms of, call it price per square meter, what's the discount rate? We thought maybe... Last time we spoke that a, a, an average apartment in Buenos Aires, that call it a two bedroom, one bath, might be listed at 130, uh, 130,000 US. But if you could pay in cash, you would probably get the deal over the line for 100,000. So that's obviously mm -hmm. a, a decent discount. Where are we at currently? What are you seeing with real estate in that area? Um, so yeah, in, in, in general, uh, month over month, it's still going down a little bit about, uh, well, close to 1%, the official uh, pricing on, uh, real estate websites. And, uh, you know, the discount is still there. It's just basically what I'm looking at right now is properties that haven't moved over the last year or the last two years. And I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out what. I'm looking actually at Provincia right now. So in Zona Norte, which is uh, just uh, out of uh, BA and then closer to the river, some really nice mansions there. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at that area maybe to live because uh, I was looking at Mar del Plata, but I still, uh, right now, I think it's too far away and I would want to stay a little bit closer to uh, Buenos Aires, but with more nature. And that area is really nice because uh, you're close to the river, you have more trees, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm looking there, I'm going to make some assessments. I'll, I'll put some threads on Twitter. I also, uh, try to publish the, uh, the per barrio, uh, meter price every month. Yeah. That, and right this now, is something people yeah. need to understand. So people coming from the, I suppose the civilized world, we're used to just being able to jump on domain or realestate.com and get a, an accurate picture of all the, the sales history that that rule does not apply to Argentina. No. Uh, no. So uh, Uncle Mara has a spreadsheet. Um, you probably you probably have the most information of real estate sales of of anyone in the country, like like any official company. <laughs> like it's it's not yeah, like you can well, look at a real estate agent's window and get an idea of what's going on. That's no, that's no, completely no. removed from reality. Yeah, it's it's totally not transparent, completely opaque, and you have no idea what kind of price movements have been before you or after you or whatever. So it's basically, uh, well, the way it was probably before the um, in in the early two thousands and before that, uh, when you didn't really have internet as uh, uh, to store all that information uh, and and you know more advanced uh, real estate websites. But here, a lot of people don't want that also from a security perspective, probably because they, uh, I think even in, if you go to New York, for example, uh, but one client there is a real estate uh, company, um, you can even see uh, sometimes like uh, get to past owners, et cetera, uh, or at least the agent who sold the property. It's, it's all like very much like a, you know, top 10 score of who sold more, et cetera. Uh, I think a lot of people here wouldn't want that. Uh, they... Uh, but that, and that when you also see disc a... discount to asking price. It's going to make no. The or or when you when you see, for example, one agent I sold like five million for five million USD in in Buenos Aires, and you just have to look up his name in the central registry, and you have his uh, all his information because here privacy laws are just basically non-existent. So if you have somebody's name, you just know his address, you know his phone number, uh, most likely, and all that stuff is right right there on the open, uh, out in the open on the government websites. So uh, that's probably also why it doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, besides the fact that, you know, it's just complete chaos, uh, the whole market. I mean, uh, somebody can really be neat. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move to Europe because I don't see any future here, which is a lot of people. Uh, if they uh, depend on the local economy, of course, uh, they're completely screwed. So they have to move and they go either to the US or to Europe. A lot of people have European passports here due to ancestry. Um, and they are in, you know, they don't have uh, more money except for what the house is worth. And then they just need the money now. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, see a, a deal like that, you could say like, okay, I'll not, uh, but I'll pay you 20% off uh, the listing price. And, you know, generally those kind of deals go through. Another thing that 
has been popping up since uh, liquidity is pretty much dried up and you know uh, the construction companies still keep building because everybody wants to keep the cash either in real estate uh, US dollars or, and you know some younger people crypto but not too much because it's too volatile um, is that the construction companies are now offering uh, longer uh, term installments so uh, I was able to snoop up two properties uh, in a new uh, building with, you know, co uh, workspace, nice pool, etc. Very nice area in Palermo Colegiales with uh, 80 installments and a 22% down. Uh, so I bought I bought a, a studio apartment and a two bedroom apartment there. Uh, or no, it's a one bedroom apartment. Because it's a two dos ambientes, which is basically a one bedroom apartment in the U.S. I think. Um, so, um, and yeah, it was just something I couldn't leave, uh, off the table. So there I had the nice, uh, interesting choice that we talked about the last time, uh, which is, uh, I, I asked them like, how is the, how are these 80 installments? How do they work? Uh, can I pay them in pesos or in dollars? And they was like, no, you can do it in dollars or in pesos and in pesos it's adjusted at the, uh, chamber of, uh, construction rate, which is basically the inflation rate, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and I already have some installments. To... Yeah. And then they keep just keep every month. They keep going up, uh, in pesos. Um, and it can spiral out of control pretty quickly. If the, you know, if, if inflation really ramps up, then it, it starts to get annoying because you never uh, pay the same amount. But at the same time, right now, I would have already had a 20% discount. Wow. The, but what I said was, because I asked like, hey, what about the dollar? Uh, uh installments then they said uh no it's just like a fixed dollar rate right. it's like oh, wow so of 84 installments with a fixed dollar rate payable outside of argentina in a u.s bank account yeah. that sounds like money to me uh in in the sense that okay for me it was kind of like i wanted that peace of mind that i didn't want to deal with the currency vo uh, volatility even and though they could exactly have made me more money, and be. I knew exactly, I know exactly what I what I'm going to pay uh, in in dollars, and it's fixed. I mean, it's a mortgage that doesn't exist in the world because every, you know it doesn't even have a percentage on it. So I pay 22 percent down, and uh, now I'm going to pay 84 uh, installments. I already paid the first one with no and, interest uh, on the, on the no interest. Rate. No, oh, no, I didn't know that. No, I thought they were, no I thought that's they were why that's why it was so compelling. No, that's why it was Jeez. like I'm going to do this now. <laughs> so, so I think I dropped like I, I dropped like 50k for the 22 percent, and the rest I'm just paying in uh, 2k installments. Gotcha. And, and those are not those are not going to go up. So I mean, it's like it's you know it's the best thing ever. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we love this country. This, where this where else we love this country? Can you do something like yes? That? You could say and, I'm going to pay for nice my house in installments, could... no interest. Yes. Plus the night because it's in dollars because everybody wants dollars yeah. and the nice yeah. thing is I'm able to pay that outside of Argentina because Zina. if we were like okay you have to pay it in uh, you have to pay it in cash here then it would cost me four percent every single month just to get the money in because I would do it on the black market of course yeah uh, so that would already be like a little bit more expensive but then still it would still be worth the effort uh, but the nice thing was like if you I mean this is just completely insane and I hope I don't burn these guys uh, by saying this but. Uh, you know, you, you uh, they asked me, okay, th this 20, 22 percent down, is it, um, is it on the books or off the books? And I said, well, this is going to be off the books because I'm still working on my uh, tax situation here. You know, I'm just trying to invoice more and more, but you know, something like this would be off the books still. <laughs> it's a little bit too much. Uh, so they said, okay, okay, no problem. Uh, and then what, basically, what happens is, whatever you sign a deed or whatever, or you know, contract like this, they have a notary, and and the notary certifies that the funds are legit. And so basically there was a point where the, we had all this money on the table for the uh, initial down payment. And then she says, okay, now it's my turn to look the other way. And then she looked the other way, they counted the money and they said, okay, so now we're going to sign this contract only about the installments. <laughs> okay. So basically, and, and they would say like, okay, we need to check this because uh, how much are you going to down pay? Okay, this, okay. And they made some sort of calculation where they said, okay, uh, we just need to verify that what you're going to pay on paper is not actually, um, uh, you know, watering down the rest of the value of the rest of the apartments that, you know, people have already paid. So they tried to make sure that, you know, I'm not paying like way below 
the actual value. Yeah, you were telling me this uh, yeah. when we when we had drinks. So, how do they do that? Because what what they're worried about is that if you if the official price is let's just say 125, and you mm-hmm. you pay 100 100 grand, if yeah. that was official, well then think about it. Then from the developer's perspective, the next person that comes along sees a previous sale at a hundred grand and says, well, I want 20% off the hundred grand. So yeah, but it's not, the, and, it's, and, not, it's not the next person because the next person is never going to see anything because it's not transparent. It's more the uh, fiscal authorities uh, also. Uh, uh, and, and, it's, and, it, and it's more like an internal thing where this is not going to show up on the books anyway in the fiscal authorities right now because it's still a building in construction. Uh, after 30 months, it will be completed. So then after those 30 months, the rest of my installments are just going to be paid by Airbnb, uh, basically. So it's, uh, you know, that's uh, the the other uh, positive of this because they are making like a, a, a complete building, which is also managed. So if I wouldn't want to manage it myself, they do the whole Airbnb thing uh, inside the building and it's completely geared towards that. Um Okay. But yeah, it's it's more like uh, once it's finished, so at around month thirty, uh, then it becomes a, a you know a, a taxable thing where the tax authorities are going to see okay he purchased this because now it's in the uh, cadaster and uh, now we're going to see okay this property exists and this is the owner. Uh, so up until that point, you can still like if I would not want that and I didn't want that uh, to pay taxes or whatever. What a lot of Argentines do is they just keep hopping from one project to the other and they sell right before finishing because you, you still have a pretty nice uh, 15% upside because the listing prices, one, uh, when you buy early, uh, they're still like 15, 20% off of the, you know, once the building is uh, finished because, you know, of course, it's a risk. You have to wait those years of, you know, the building process. And you have to wait those out before, you know, there's actually uh, an apartment. So um, that's also an option. Uh, you know, if I wanted to, I could still sell that. And they actually offered me for the ones. three years when it would go into yeah. the official register. And yeah. in that case, it would just be like it never happened, and that you never <laughs> exactly it would it would just it, it just didn't happen. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, real estate here is really something else. It's it's just like the, I remember, like in 2010, when I bought my first house here, uh, just stepping in a taxi with a a, a backpack full of dollars, <laughs> just going there, and everybody counting the whole thing. It was, it's just so much fun, you know. <laughs> and never how, how to get the it's never a dull moment. How to get the money here because of all because back then there was also the the black market has always been uh, an issue because there's always been a restriction on dollars. So mm. as far as I, I remember, uh, so back then too, I, I think uh, at a certain point because uh, I was still uh, I had some bank accounts in Brazil because I lived there first, and then I took way too much money over the border. What you know legally you can bring in 10k, and I just went. Uh, t- I took a bus from Sao Paulo, and I was just stuffed with cash, and I was just like fuck it. <laughs> I'm going to do it this way. And I, yeah. So I brought in the majority uh, that way. And then I, I, I bumped into another Dutch guy. He was selling his house here and he, uh, and he actually gave me the rest of what I needed. Uh, and I just transferred it outside of Argentina. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's always a way it's like, you know, how, how to do it. And if, of course, if amounts are bigger, uh, you know, if amounts are higher around, you know, uh, you know, 300 plus K, then you know it becomes like a lot more uh, meticulous where you really need to have more of like a transactional history etc uh, of how, how you paid for this but then still in those cases as long as you have like source of funds etc you can just transfer it to uh, to somebody outside of argentina and you just pay the fees here taxes here and it's all fine it doesn't even touch the ground so uh it's it's fairly easy the thing is like liquidity is just not there so if you buy something really expensive um and not a deal uh, where you know at least with a deal you have a really big difference where if you sell it you may just make a lot of money uh, at once and in the meantime you can just rent it out but you know if you buy something that is you know uh, pretty pretty uh, expensive already then just you know keep in in mind that it might be if you want to sell it it might be on the market for a long time that's the only thing Okay. 
And what's the situation with Airbnb? A lot of people complaining about Airbnb around the world. Yeah, I mean, quality, it's, quality it's of become... dwellings low, prices. I've noticed prices, uh, not in Argentina, but uh, particularly in Mexico and and Colombia, they were they were really expensive. Um, like rules, so many rules. Oh, you can't eat or drink in the pool area. Uh, you can't do this. You can't do that. Um, it, oh, by the way, it's called Airbnb, but we don't give you breakfast. You got to get your own breakfast. Um, what's what are the chances of a black market Airbnb being formed? Is this something that uh, I've heard you speak? Well, about? I mean that that's uh, that's that's going to be the case if uh, uh, you know locals keep complaining because basically um they created a law where they gave much more rights to the uh renters uh in local peso rents and local peso rents are about four or five times cheaper than dollar rents uh, furnished dollar rents are a lot uh more expensive and they're becoming more and more expensive just because of the amount of digital nomads uh coming here etc but also because of this law where basically owners don't want to deal with this issue where you have to have somebody three years minimum it used to be two now it's already three years and there's only uh, one instance per year where you can up the price. And it used to be, uh, you know, up to the owner when they up the price. And usually they would just have a contract where it said like, okay, every three months we're going to uh, see where the inflation's at. And then we're just going to up the rent, which, you know, everybody was fine with and it worked fine. There was a lot of uh, uh, offer uh, supply. And as soon as that retarded law came into being, uh, everybody already said from the get-go that this was going to really crush supply. And that's basically what happened. So now everybody just you know, started furnishing their apartments and renting it out to foreigners uh, because they didn't want to deal with that uh, issue where they couldn't up their rents uh, more than once a year. Uh, so right now we have another a new situation where the... Um, the guy who invented that law, he's basically, they're going to scrap the law, but they're going to, going to create a new one. Now, my fear is that that new one will be like anti-Airbnb, uh, et cetera, like they have in a lot of other cities in Europe also. And it's yes, going to be easy, a lot easy harder. It's scapegoat to blame Airbnb. Exactly. You know, rather yeah, than address what actually caused the problem in the first place. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, if they would just leave the market, you know, uh, do uh, whatever it does uh, and find the uh, supply and demand, then it works just fine. It worked fine for all these years that I've been here. In the last three years, it's just been a disaster if you have to rent in pesos, you know. Because another thing that happens besides uh, no supply is that once uh, one frees up and they want to, uh, uh, you know, put it on the market, they just up the price so gigantically high just to not run the risk because of all this inflation that properties have actually, uh, you know, the rents have gone up uh, way above inflation, uh, and which makes it really hard. People are just literally, they can't keep up, you know? And I mean, uh, local people on a peso salary, they're completely screwed in that sense. So I understand the frustration, but you know, uh, another law is not the answer here. Yeah, but the uh, reason, yeah, yeah. I guess the reason the landlords have done this is because they don't have the chance to keep up with inflation, so they can't take. That of risk. course, yeah. I mean, I would do the same thing if I were uh, offering a property on the uh, local uh, rental market uh, in pesos. Uh, I would say, like, look, I can't raise my prices. Look at what happened now. It's just like it went up uh 20 percent, which means that a lot of people and a lot of companies will uh, probably up their things about 30 40 uh i mean and i can only raise my rents once a year <laughs> hell no i'm gonna you know that that just doesn't make any sense so uh, uh because at the same time you know uh people with the salary uh, there's a lot of union activity here in argentina and uh salaries tend to lose out about five to ten percent a year uh versus inflation but you know they still get up like a hundred percent every year uh, so it's not like you know those salaries get cut in half every year uh, that's not the case they do earn less and they have less purchasing power every single year but you know it's it's more in the range of um you know five ten percent uh maybe 15 uh, with a uh, more inflation like we have now uh, but the raising is actually pretty uh, significant. If you look at it from a business perspective, where you think in maybe in dollar terms, it's like, you know, what, I'm going to raise your salary by 100% this year. <laughs> That's basically what's happening. <laughs> yeah. 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 So how am I, how am I going to pay? How am I going to pay for that? Yeah. 
So that, that you know, and that is also dr trickles down to pricing. Uh, we all these people that, that have these union salary increases, that's all uh, in prices again. And then they're going to add more taxes to everything, which they always do. And, you know, everything is just uh, a hyperinflation waiting to happen, basically, at this point. And so, okay, let's say we do get we get this hyperinflation. Millet does not win. We're still on this. Uh, Argentina keeps its central bank. Uh, it It's surely going to lead to another default, which would be its 10th default in its history. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it's around the tenth. Uh, so, does that mean <laughs> a new currency is formed? Um, do they start printing new bills? Uh, because it's it's insane. What's the highest denomination in terms of its bill? Oh yeah, that, that's another story where you know this is a completely um, a neglect of of the reality that's happening on the ground. Is that they do not want to print high denomination bills because they think that would increase inflation. Uh, which uh, probably has some merit to it, but uh, at the same time, you know, inflation is happening just because they're expanding the money, uh, monetary supply all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to happen anyways. And the downside is right now is that uh, they just don't have enough paper uh, for all the thousand peso bills, which by now is like 50 cents almost. So um, that that's the highest uh, denominated bill and they're gonna uh, print a, a 2001 uh, for starting june uh, that will already be you know uh, that nothing they, yeah. Yeah, by that time it should be 10,000 uh, and the, the funny thing is that they are basically spending reserves to bring that paper to argentina because they don't have uh, enough paper here uh, so they're printing in brazil they're printing in france and they're printing in malta and in china so they have to get foreign uh, and, reserves to pay for the paper. Yeah, foreign reserves to pay for the paper. The printed paper comes back to Argentina. And, you know, the golden uh, video about this was, uh, and this is how some people in this government, she was actually a government official. And she was talking on the TV and she was being interviewed and she was saying like, yeah, basically when you think about it this way, since we're not printing it locally, domestically, it doesn't have that much of an impact on inflation. <laughs> Oh, no. So, uh, this, I mean, my ears just burn when I hear that shit. I mean, it, it's just like incredible. These people are in government and these are not like dumb people. They actually had private education. They went to good schools and that's the shit that comes out of their mouths. You know? so, but I guess, you know, that, that Joseph Goebbels line that if you repeat a lie enough times, people eventually eventually believe. Well, no, but the the worst thing is that I think she actually believed it, and then afterwards, so yeah. many people called it out, uh, and then she said, like, "Look, I'm, I made a mistake. I understand it now, and that that's not the case." But she really believed it at that point, which is that's the level that we're dealing with for some government officials. I think you know smarter people probably like Massa, they understand it more. But he also he's a lawyer and he's the minister of economy. He doesn't know shit about e economics, he's probably, crazy. and he's just winging it. And he's doing a pretty good job for a lawyer, but he's not an economist. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he doesn't. He, he no longer has any soybeans to try and peg the MEP. Uh, exactly. Like, yeah, they, they lost their, uh, their their soybean base. <laughs> yeah. And I think like that's got to be political too, right? Like I noticed in Colombia, you have a yeah you know, a fifty thousand peso note. You've got all these like massive denominations where you just they eventually just had to keep in, increasing the face value uh, or nominal value on the uh, on the currency. Um, like it's uh, if they. If they keep slashing these zeros or adding zeros, um, then what happens? Like things just keep going the way they're going, right? Like they just nothing. yeah, no, it, not 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 a whole lot changes. So uh, even with the default, like in two thousand fourteen, like nobody noticed. Um, it just they they just didn't pay what they were owed, and you know they that that's a technical default because they just didn't pay <laughs> they needed to pay, but nothing happened uh now no, then they got another the, loan for 60 billion four years later yeah yeah exactly i mean they uh and uh and i think uh, afterwards it was even worse where uh kichilov who's the uh, governor now of the province of buenos aires uh he restructured a, a deal with the club of paris at very unfavorable conditions and uh that ended up costing the the country a lot more money than it it should have 
And they're just leaking all over the place because then they have this, you know, really populist thing where uh, IPF, the uh, oil company, should be nationalized or partially nationalized. So they uh, had a, a majority ownership again, and they just completely neglected all the current stock owners. And they just said, like, now it's like half of it is the Argentine state, and which, you know, uh, trickled down into, I think now they lost a 20 plus billion dollar lawsuit uh, uh, because they did that. And that's also something that the taxpayer is going to have to cough up here. But the funny thing is with that, it's, it's, this is really, I need to write this down in the post because it's really mind blowing. But basically what happened is um, at that, uh, you know, way back when Nestor Kirchner was still governor in Santa Cruz before he was a president, um, he did some, uh, some things with the uh, 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 provincial funds where uh, a lot of that cash he said i'm going to store that in switzerland so he uh, like basically the the whole uh <laughs> the, it raises no the, red flags whatsoever no red flags so that was all stored in switzerland and then basically uh, a lot of that was lost the tracks like how that actually uh, came back to argentina etc but at the same time he had like a, a couple of uh, uh, local companies that were also involved in ipf it and that were also uh, granted uh, certain stock options in EPF. And basically when they nationalized uh, those companies, which were uh, basically Testaferros, which is uh, like a, a name holder for Kirchner, uh, which is what you know, uh, the suspicion is, uh, he was basically laundering uh, money through them uh, you know, so he would, would get access to that, those funds. Um, they ended up uh, with a big chunk of IPF, and they were already uh, big holders of IPF before the nationalization. When they nationalized, uh, you know, there was all this uh, buha and populism, etc. And then that same group started the fucking uh, lawsuit in New York. Whoa, so, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, no, this is really this so these... is really high tech corruption which you know this this you don't see this anywhere else so basically these people that were testiferos of nestor kirchner that were already they they were given those shares at that point uh, they, were, they point. were they were straw men straw men yeah that, that's the With, word in english i was uh, yeah exactly yeah. i was i was looking for that word so they yeah. were straw men they were given a part of of epf way before the nationalization and uh, it was a, it was a very significant uh, chunk uh, and then once they nationalized and, you know, they publicized it everywhere and uh, they're still like part is still privately owned by stockholders outside of Argentina. But you know, So did those straw is... men, as part of the nationalization, did they get compensation from the state where they, they received the payout? No, no, uh, uh, that, that was all uh, how that actually w uh, came about was I think they did receive some kind of compensation. I need to check the details on that because I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, but the thing is, like, they were not consulted. So that's why they were able to uh, start a lawsuit in New York saying, like, look, they just nationalized this and we weren't consultant. We were st stockholders. So they just basically neglected U.S. law because this was traded on the New York Stock Exchange. And, and this was the, the same company that got those shares basically gifted. And uh, after nationalization, started this $20 billion lawsuit. So they, they've double dipped. They've received all these basically yeah. free shares from the nationalization. Now they've turned around to sue the government, which is essentially the people. Well, oh, no, but that, no, they, they did it. Uh, it was smarter than that because they uh, uh, they already had like a really big chunk of IPF before the nationalization. So basically they were part of the private shareholder pool that was before the nationalization. Then the government said, we're going to nationalize this. And they said, but hold up. We weren't consulted. consulted. Then they went they, and they went to New York. And that's basically the straw man uh, starting that whole judicial process in New York and now winning for $22 billion against the Argentine state. <laughs> but so, the people but essentially those straw people are Kushner and other people in the Argentine state. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my god. So the money is just coming back in a different way, you know? <laughs>
<laughs> you can't make this up. This is no, no. I, this is this is really. I'm gonna because uh, I, I have a long thread with a lot of details, uh, not on on my Twitter, but I've, uh, on a couple of guys that I follow, and it's really well documented. And these guys are just like, it's so fucked up, and it's it's really clear that you know it's just basically money laundering in a different way, very creative. But, uh, you know, the, in the end, uh, people who pay 160% tax are, are, you know, footing the bill. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're never bored in Argentina. You're never bored in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always, uh... <laughs> you never fail to surprise me uh okay we're coming up on well you know we're talking before this we're coming up nearly on two hours uh oh, guys damn, yeah. uh, <laughs> make sure you make sure you check out uh mara's Substack. stack uh, free uh free options where you can subscribe for free and get access to uh, all of this amazing information in a very well-written condensed format um so do check out the link that i will leave in the description uh Argentina, what else can we say about Argentina uh, before we wrap this up for next time? Well, you know, I think besides all the turmoil and, you know, this is some a question that I get often on, on Twitter as well is, you know, how dangerous is it? Because now everything must be That's like in flames goes. and burning to the ground. And But, you know, day to day, uh, I just take out the stroller with my two daughters and, you know, there's absolutely nothing is different from before. I mean, and these people are so used to chaos that they just don't care anymore. And that's why they're to completely numb to these kind of uh, currency devaluations, et cetera. Um, they just go on with their lives, have their asados, and uh, try not to think about it too much, basically. I guess it gets to that, uh, it gets to that point where you... Yeah. Just, it's, it's, it's almost a century. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's 80, been, 80 uh, years of, of peronismo. 80 years. Más, más o menos, yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess you just it it's it's cultural now, isn't it? Like it's it generations. Yeah, it is. I mean, and, and that's environment. why what makes it also so difficult to change the mindset because a lot of people they really believe this narrative of you know uh, bad uh, entrepreneurs uh, upping prices and uh, the good government is here to to help me and subsidize and. You know, uh, I can understand, like, if if you were born in the 90s and you had, you know, not a whole lot of help from the government, and then when you see all these initiatives, it looks like, oh, yeah, they're really, you know, I could have never, ever dreamt of them doing all this, uh, which, you know, it's still like a, a pretty high standard for other developing nations in that sense, where there's just a lot of money in Argentina. But, you on know, uh, hand, but at what cost? on the other Exactly. At, at what cost, you know, and, that, and that's the thing that the, it lives together with this uh, insane inflation and, and really high uh, likelihoods of defaults all the time. Um, and, you know, not a really secure business environment to, uh, to do things locally, because, you know, I would be very happy to uh, reopen all my companies here and just start uh, hammering away and invoicing locally. Uh, I'm just not going to do that because it's, uh, you know, it just makes no sense at this point. And just, well, I'll just do everything outside of Argentina and just declare what I have to declare here. And then uh, that's it, you know? Yeah. So you're not worried that this, uh, we mentioned it could be worse than 89 and 2001. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not worried from a, a safety perspective, like if things really No, from a safety that. perspective, definitely not. I mean, um, it's not going to be like a Brazil when you saw Bolsonaro and, you know, the the recent elections and you had millions of people in the streets and it's just a different animal isn't it like yeah well i mean brazil is really comparable to the u.s in that sense it's like uh it's so huge and um the you know it's it's really the mammoth of the uh of latin america basically and ne next to mexico uh and it, it is really comparable on, on you know the amount of consumerism um uh, the the internal dynamics of the the political situation uh, and in other countries is just a little bit more regional in that sense and and Brazil is really you know uh, the United States or Brazil and it really works that way um, in Argentina it's it's uh, you know a, a kind of like the smaller brother uh, of uh, Brazil uh, but then even more regionalized it's it's very european in that sense where the whole uh, way the government is structured etc it's uh, 
it's a lot more uh, like uh, Europe and also the way the uh, provincial um, governments are structured. It's, it's a lot like Spain, for example, where they have some at uh, autonomy, but uh, I think even in Spain, they have more autonomy, the uh, provinces than, than here. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I just hope that uh, at a certain point, uh, it, it, it kind of turns around where the local business environment starts getting interesting and because really Argentines are the greatest entrepreneurs alive. I mean, they're these amazing. people, yeah. they're amazing. They're beasts. I mean, they go through, uh, some, some companies still on their feet after 80 years of, of going through these cycles and they just keep surviving. And it's just insane. You know, it's like they're super human <laughs> in that sense. So if just with the, uh, the tiniest bit of economic, openness and non-capital controls or whatever and you know, just, lowering a taxation. Less just a little bit less it doesn't even have to be dollarization i mean they would just like completely crush it uh you know they have great demographics uh, great resources uh, no need for food imports or whatever you know they have everything you want is here in argentina uh it, it's just a matter of you know uh opening up the borders a little bit more in terms of what can come in uh, lowering import taxes, etc., so people can you know have access to better kind of te technology, etc., and you know you can have a liftoff. Uh, and especially, I think that, you know lowering the the tax burden for uh, local companies is just like a must. But with the IMF breathing down the necks, I don't think that is in the cards. Uh, but ideally, you know that's the only way that that, that this is going to grow or you know do anything different because. Otherwise, you're always going to have this parallel economy, which is also great. You know, a lot of you know, like kind of Indiana Jones feel to it. But for locals, it's not that great. You know, it's and that's why it's the <laughs> I wrote in the uh, the latest article with the tale of two currencies is like it's really two separate worlds that you live in. If you're on the dollar standard here, you know, king of the hill. If you're earning local pesos, you just want to kill yourself and you want to move somewhere else like right away because it's unsustainable crazy i mean yeah chaos beauty the finer things of life everything you want but everything you don't want is argentina the best country in the world well i think it's 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 pretty close i mean i i love the chaos uh and at the same time i just wanted to go away a little bit more just you know <laughs> so everything starts to function uh but, you know, from a, a country perspective, in terms of natural beauty, things to do, et cetera, and, and the history, it's just an insanely beautiful country uh, and Absolutely. with great people, uh, great quality of life. Uh, the location also is, uh, you know, I think with all the uh, geo turmoil that is going on in Europe, et cetera, it's, it's one of the best locations to be in. Uh, you're relatively far away from all that stuff. Uh, and um, and at the same time, you're sort of in the hemisphere of the United States with the Monroe Doctrine, which I think they're going to they're going to push that doctrine through the IMF. Basically, <laughs> they're just going to they're just going to uh, to try to uh, have Argentina steer clear of uh, more China deals uh, through the IMF. But we have to see what China does because at the same time, you know, and I'm I'm definitely not a proponent of having more CCP influence here, which is already way too much in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, China could be the, the helping hand saying like, look, you know, we can give a, a couple more swaps if you give us, um, you know, some more, uh, got, terrain bit, got any, or... got any lithium in that, uh, you got any <laughs> lithium there in the North, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've been reading about this. I'm going to, I'm going to do another article on this, but the, uh, Tierra del Fuego, um, uh, Harbor, uh, the port is going through. So uh, the uh, Chinese are actually going to build a port there, which uh, with the main, uh, it's going to be their port uh, with access to the Pacific and the Atlantic and uh, access to an, uh, Antarctica. So you, it's a really the US cheap... are going to stand by and let that happen. Well, I mean, it's already happening. So uh, uh, that's why that's why this whole thing is going to be a very interesting. What's going to happen uh, from this point onwards? Because we have all this BRICS narrative about de-dollarization, et cetera. Uh, you know, and, yeah, and, and at this point, it's still a fairy tale in my opinion as well. But at the same time, you know, it does make sense if you look at Argentina now scrapping for dollars, scraping for dollars. 
if they could just do regional trade with Brazil in, in a, a secondary currency that they control, I mean, that makes way more sense than settling trades in New York, for example. Well, sure, it gives a lot more control um, back to the back to the other. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I, you know, from those trade perspectives, I can totally understand the BRICS uh, point of view. From a currency reserve, uh, foreign reserve uh, perspective, definitely not. I mean, they're not going to change their <laughs> reserves to one because it's you know it's a capital controlled currency. As soon as uh, it has the same dynamics as the US dollar, they're going to have a capital flight that uh, makes the peso blush uh, basically because uh, you know every Chinese uh, uh, millionaire is going to want to rush everything out of the country. Which by now I think they have only a, a 50k per person. Uh, max per year that they can take out. So once you open that floodgate, uh, which would be the characteristic of a, a true reserve currency, which is open and uh, you know everybody has can to be use open that, capital account. has to be open. Uh, then you know the one is going to devaluate pretty significantly uh, once that happens. So I don't think China is going to allow that. So and that's why it's also not going to be a reserve currency, but. You know, it could be a, an interesting trade currency pegged to maybe commodities or settled on the Shanghai exchange. That's definitely going to happen. I mean, yeah. the yeah, the the dumbest action basically well, already, this whole it already Russia really has happened. If you look at the ruble, I mean, yeah. it's essentially on a. I, I know the ruble's you know banned, but essentially it's on a, a gold slash gas standard right now. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you know, and, and they have silently uh, started ramping up those trades in the last couple of years, and and basically freezing Russia's foreign reserves has, has kicked this into overdrive, and that's why we're seeing yeah. so much uh, news about it, because suddenly all these emerging economies are realizing, hey, what we have st stashed there, as soon as they don't like us, they might freeze our assets. So, yeah, it's it's, it's totally logical as well uh, from that perspective. Yeah, so interesting. It's an interesting world. I'm sure that we're going to have uh, a lot more to talk about uh, next time. <laughs> next time we catch up. <laughs> um, anything I missed? Anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Um, no, no. I think uh, we covered pretty much everything. I mean, you know, we'll see what happens in the coming days because definitely the coming days will be like months uh, from everything that's happened. So we'll see Literally. what. Uh, you know, yeah what what's going to if they're going to devaluate if you know they're going to uh, take some people out of the key positions and re reshuffle them um i don't know uh, what's going to happen but it's definitely not over yet and there's not there's been no or well, at least from what i've seen before talk there's been no official statement whatsoever about this price movement <laughs> It yeah, and once happen. once that statement comes out that's when you that's when you worry when they officially deny they're going to deval they're going to deval Yes, yes. That that used to be that usually that's the case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are there are weeks where decades happen, decades where weeks happen. Keep your eyes open this week, guys, for uh decades worth of uh, happenings, uh or just another week in Argentina. Uh thank you for joining me again, my <laughs> friend. Uh it's always great to speak with you. And once again, guys, reminder, Mara's Substack uh, link will be in the description. Take care and look forward to catching up with you in another episode of the ROI podcast. Take care, guys.